Hi everyone, and welcome to the final game in this series on Bobby Fischer's My 60 Memorable Games. We'll return to it at a later date, but coming up on Saturday is the Chorus Tournament, and after that we'll move on to some end game study, as promised. This is the tenth game in the series, so it seemed like a nice round number to stop at. This game was played at New York in 1961 against Samuel Ryshevsky who was arguably the greatest player in America until the emergence of Bobby Fischer. He had an awesome record with wins against all the world champions of the 20th century at that time. And like Fischer, he won the US championships on eight occasions, although this was before Fischer was on the scene, as he won it every time he entered into it. Ryshevsky was originally Russian, but his parents brought him to America at the age of nine, when he was already a famous child prodigy. There was no love lost between the two opponents here. To quote Frank Brady, Fisher's biographer, Ryshevsky especially had reasons for enmity. Having earned world respect during a reign of many years, he'd been abruptly dethroned, defeated, and all but exiled from the honors of an insurrect youngster with no consistent fear of anybody. There was a lot of money at stake in this, in this match, not to mention careers and reputations, and it was a very tense affair by all accounts. And this is the second game from it. It was a match they played in 1961, which was organized by the United States Chess Federation. Fischer had the white pieces, and he opened with e4, and one of Ryshevsky's only weaknesses was his opening preparation. He was known to take far longer than average in the opening, and as a result, he often got into time trouble later in the game. Here he played the Sicilian with c5, which Fischer was an expert in, and he continued with the book line knight f3, and Ryshevsky continued with knight c6, which is one of many ways to play the Sicilian. Fischer continued with the book line d4, and now comes c takes d4, knight takes d4, and g6, so an accelerated dragon variation. It's more common for black to play knight f6 before he plays g6 because this means that white will play knight c3 and therefore not be able to create a Moroxy bind as he can now by playing c4. Apparently Ryshevsky had booked up on that line for the match although it's a very irritating bind to allow white to have. And another point of the accelerated dragon is that it omits d6 from the opening, as is common in Sicilians, with the hope of playing d5 in one move later, thereby saving a tempo. Aware of Ryshevsky's likely preparation and weakness with regard to the opening, Fischer didn't now play the Moroxy bind with c4, but instead played knight c3. In game 8 of this match he did play it, and he got an advantage. After c4, knight f6, knight c3, knight takes d4, queen takes d4, d6, bishop e2, bishop g7, bishop e3, castles, and queen d2. And the point of this bind is that it makes it very hard for black to free his game and thus equalize with the move d5. And it's worth reading up about on Wikipedia if you don't know about it already. But anyway, back to the game continuation. Fischer has just played knight c3. And Ryshevsky continued with bishop g7 and pressure on the knight at d4. So bishop e3. And now knight f6 and bishop e2. Also good is bishop c4. Where one line continues with black castling. And now bishop b3. And knight g4. If instead knight a5 trying to snap up the bishop pair, now white has a strong continuation with e5, which is only playable because black has just played knight a5, his knight was controlling e5 from c6, and knight e8 is the best bet for black here. If knight takes b3 instead, then white has a big edge after e takes f6. And here, white has a brilliant continuation. If you want to try and spot it, then stop the video now. Bishop takes f7 is the move, and this wins the black queen. 
no matter how black takes the knight. For example, if rook takes f7, now knight e6, and incredibly, the queen has no square to move to. c7 is covered by the knight, b6 is covered by the bishop, and there's no d takes e6 because of queen takes d8. Um, so obviously white is completely winning here. And Fischer got Ryshevsky with this trap in the US Championships of 1958-59. So it's a, another great one to know if you're playing against a Sicilian. So that line is bad for black. So instead of knight a5, knight g4 is the correct move to play. But now white has queen takes g4. And after knight takes d4, either queen h4 or queen d1 are enough to secure white a small edge as happened later in the match between these two rivals so bishop e2 anyway is the line that Fischer went for in this match and Ryshevsky castled here and it should be noted here too that playing d5 again trying to free the game and equalize now loses a pawn to bishop b5 with the threat of knight takes c6 and after b takes c6 bishop takes c6 winning the exchange which forces bishop d7 now e takes d5 and white's won a pawn so Ryshevsky castled instead and Fischer played f4 and of this position he wrote despite his familiarity with the dragon variation I felt Ryshevsky really didn't know the latest wrinkles in Alekhine's attack. The point of black's accelerated fianchetto becomes apparent if white plays here instead castling, where now black can free his game with d5, because after e takes d5, knight b4 wins back the pawn and equalizes for black. So f4 instead from Fischer. And now d6. If instead d5, now white has an edge with e5. And if knight e4, then knight takes e4, d takes e4, knight takes c6, b takes c6, queen takes d8, rook takes d8, and bishop c4. And white has a winning ending when he's able to play like Bobby Fischer. The point is that black has doubled e pawns and also two isolated pawns on the queen side and with correct play against these weaknesses white should win so Ryshevsky avoided that and he played d6 instead now came knight b3 which is still opening theory we're still well within the book lines here and next came bishop e6 and with this move Fischer's suspicions about Ryshevsky not being up to date on opening theory were proved correct he wrote I was right this is the old and second rate move. Correct is a5, where the line given goes a4, and only now bishop e6, where knight d4 is now a weak move, but preferable to g4 because of knight b4, and the knight can't be dislodged quickly with a3 because white's played a4, and the best option is for white to castle the move beforehand instead at move 11 after uh, bishop e6 he should just castle but now rook c8 and black's equalized and the reason why knight d4 is a weak move is because of queen b6 uh, it looks unwise because now knight takes e6 discovers an attack on the queen and the rook but now comes queen takes e3 and although it loses the exchange after knight takes, takes f8 now knight g4 and black has a strong attack with good enough compensation for the material deficit at worst it's equal so bishop e6 is what Ryshevsky has just played and now came g4 immediately starting the pawn storm with his king still in the center and this is the last book move in Fritz's database of this game because here Ryshevsky played d5 and Fritz gave instead rook c8 and thinks that this move gives white a small edge playing d5 here and Ryshevsky can hardly be blamed for wanting to open the game up given the position of the white king 
Okay, that's the end of part one.